Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday night edition. Uh, tonight's topic is it will be oral antibiotics and oral antivirals in eye care with our speaker, my partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell. He's a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutritional Society. He works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management and management uh, of ocular disease, both anterior and posterior segment. He's been a participant in multiple FDA clinical trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care management. So he practices integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He has lectured extensively throughout the U.S. and over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he served as the president of the POA, Pennsylvania Optometric Association, and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 through 2016. And he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, let's uh, welcome uh, my partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell, to talk about orals and eye care. Greg, take it away. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, tonight, we're not going to do too much of integrative and functional medicine. Probably the best thing that we can remember is you know, when we prescribe those antibiotics for patients, whether it's for hordeolum dacryocystitis, remember we're messing up someone's uh, uh, microbial count in their gut. We all hear about leaky gut and say so probably should be doing, and that could be anywhere from a week to two years. So it's not a set, something set in stone. So make sure that we do use these antibiotics properly and not, uh, not judiciously for everything. Uh, Cause remember we do kill off the, the good flora in that, in that gut, allowing those bad bacteria to take over. And that's what creates that leaky gut. So prebiotics, postbiotics, probiotics, all very important, but we're not going to get really into that when we would cover that in a, in a future lecture coming up in October. So with that being said, uh, here are the disclosures. Uh, the content and the activity was independently repaired by me. Really, there's not too many things I have to cover in this oral antiviral. I don't really lecture or have been on an advisory board for really any of the companies listed here. And I don't put those lists there to really impress you. But Joe and I, as practitioners, me more in a private setting, Joe was in academia for quite a few years. Uh, but now in the private practice setting, you know, we don't really do this stuff to impress you, but if we're going to try and bring you updated. We try to stay plugged into these companies. Um, sit as the PA uh, medical director for Involve, um, healthcare registries, chairman for diabetes and macular degeneration. But more importantly, if I mention anything during this talk that seems to be superior or uh, there's really no commercial bias and um, there's no claims of superiority, maybe just evidence-based medicine that's out there. And as Joe said, uh, half owner and uh, all of these have been mitigated through, through Arbo. So the agenda tonight, we're going to hit quickly on the pregnancy categories. We're going to talk antibiotics, antivirals, but really what I try to do and Joe tries to do is to try and make things clinically relevant, how you can apply them in patient care, avoid pitfalls, and uh, increase your confidence when selecting an oral <laughs> antibiotic or antiviral. So if we go back to the original uh, FDA pregnancy categories, we have category A, B, C, D, and X. And X just sounds bad, so that just creates fetal abnormalities. And really, they don't really do studies on this. You know, this is when I do my talk with uh, you know Dr. Offerdahl, who's a pharmacist. You know, a lot of the, the pregnancy category comes afterwards. Like you see these shows where, you know, you know, someone didn't realize they were pregnant and they gave birth at like Walmart, right? And it's, you can't believe that can happen. But, you know, things like that do happen, but they've been on certain medications and that's how we get a lot of these. But when you see that, you know, previous pregnancy category, A, it was no risk. B, you know, animal studies uh, were done and showed no risk or animal toxicity, or you know, the animal studies uh, didn't need to be done, or the animal studies showed that there was toxicity and there was no human risk. 
Category C, when it comes into play, this is where most of our medications are. And again, it's really found out just by people didn't realize they were pregnant for, you know, maybe weeks or months, and then they were on a medication. Um, so that's where they kind of get lumped in if they're really not sure, or maybe there is some testing. And then category D, there's evidence of human risk. And again, we talked about category X. But this all kind of changed uh, back in 2014. Um, and then it finally went into effect in June 30th of 2015. And we've seen those package inserts change uh, on our medications. If you just got something new, to, like Isuvis, and you open it up, you're going to know now where to look for pregnancy, lactation, uh, female and male reproductive potential. And that's 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3 on that package insert. 8.1 will give us that, uh, that pregnancy uh, risk that's out there. The risk summary um, is, uh, is a required uh, subheading. They're allowed to admit if there's nothing applicable about the pregnancy exposure registry. And you can just kind of go down and read this slide. But it's if you want to, you know, you got something new in the practice, um, new medication, I believe Rocklitan and, and, and Repressa came out after 2015. So they're going to use this kind of 8.1, uh, 8.2 for lactation, the risk, the clinical considerations, the data, and then the female and male reproduction. If you get those questions, you can just open up the package insert, Google the package insert, um, and just go to 8.1, 8.2, or 8.3. And this is just kind of an example right here of one. This is one we're going to be talking about tonight. This is Valtrex. And again, the Valtrex, if you jump down to 8.1, you can see it's like a book, right? There's section one, section two. And if you get down to section, uh, section eight, you can see uh, pregnancy. There's nothing there on 8.2, but then there's 8.3. But you can see that Valtrex was out before 2014. So they kind of do this hybrid, right? I kind of like category A, B, C, D, and X. It made it easy and then they changed it. But in the older medications, they're still going to show what it was, category B. And that's pretty awesome, right? If you have someone who comes in that is pregnant and has a dendrite on their cornea, that's cool. It's safe category B to use to use Valtrex. And you can see there's nothing on 8.2 to report, but for the nursing mothers here, they do have something to report on 8.3. So here we are jumping into, looks like Zydra. And I just picked Zydra because it came out uh, and after the, the ruling. And you can see here, if you jump down to the eight, you can see pregnancy, lactation, but there's nothing on the reproductive system. There might be now, I might've scanned this a while back, that could be updated, but again, you're gonna go see pregnancy, but notice how there's no category A, B, C, D, or X, because they don't follow that. That came in after the June 30th, 2015. So you can read here about, you know, there's no available data on Zydra in pregnant women. And you can jump down here, lactation uh, summary, uh, and then out there, they don't have anything on the reproduction, which is 8.3. So just, you know, just wanted to point it out. That's where you go if you have questions on prescribing medications. And with that being said, we'll do polling question number one here. Get everyone back into the swing of things. Uh, we have uh, polling question one. A patient has a severe allergic reaction to penicillin and Keflex. I saw those popping up. Penicillin derivatives, and Keflex, like EpiPen, right? IgE. Uh, swelling of the throat, bronchial constriction, true anaphylaxis. Which antibiotic would you use? I believe I made this multiple. Yep, it says it right there, multiple choice. Uh, which antibiotic would you reach for out there uh, if you're allergic and have that um, EpiPen reaction? Questions and answers are rolling in. They're rolling in nice. Looks like we have 206 people in attendance tonight. Thanks everyone for attending. So we got a nice doctor of cystitis here. What I'm doing is I'm pushing on the lacrimal sac. You can see here, I'm getting this nice pus material. 
this was a kind of a case presentation that I do at a different case. I just kind of shortened it up here. This person was in for like the third or fourth time with this bacterial <laughs> conjunctivitis. And what we were doing is just pushing. And I got a little surprised when I pushed on this nasal lacrimal sac. So I think we got a pretty good reply. So I'm going to end the poll. Thanks for launching that, Joe. Share the results. And, uh, you know, augmenting. Um, you know, I said penicillin. Um, I didn't really put augmentin in here as amoxicillin and potassium clavuronate. So we want to be careful with augmentin, right? Even though we use it a lot um, in eye care, and you're going to see the reason why. Uh, but be careful if we have an EpiPen-like reaction with Augmentin. z pack is great. We want to stay away from a Keflex because it is Cephalexin. Again, I didn't put the, the name Keflex over here. I didn't put Amoxicillin here. Uh, and again, Azithromycin, I believe Bactrim and Cipro. I think these are all good uh, medications to use. This was my uh, antibiotic paradigm through 2019. Um, I liked penicillin and the macrolides because they're pediatric friendly, geriatric friendly. Mm -hmm. They are safe in pregnancy. Um, they're great for just about everyone and anyone other than if they're allergic to penicillin, right? If they're allergic to penicillin, then you don't want to use it. Um, and so the drug of choice then is the macrolides. And again, great, gram positive, gram negative, geriatrics, pediatrics, whole scope of people uh, that you could use it on, just had to really worry about the allergies. And as we move down, you know, there's things to remember. Keflex is better for adults. The quinolones, they have their limitation. And then the old sulfur allergy that we're going to talk about here tonight. But I said this was it since 2019. What changed in 2020? Well, the cipros and the fluoroquinolones were being used more and more, and there were just more and more issues popping on. That's usually how drugs, you know, and adverse drug side effects occur by the more people using it that were in the studies. And that's why they follow and they have medical science liaisons out there to really track all this. So sulfa moved up and the fluoroquinolones and Cipro moved way down. There's a lot of things that can happen when you use those tendon ruptures, you know, the, Q, the QT uh, uh, heart issues that can happen. So with that being said, I didn't realize I had this in here so quick. This is the one that's at the bottom. So I'm going to do this polling question. Have you ever had a person allergic to a sulfa antibiotic and you prescribed Trusopt, Azopt, Cosopt, or Diamox and nothing happened? Like, what the heck? You know, what happened here? You know, that's supposed to be not be the way it is, the way we were taught. So have you done it or you just would never do that? So you've done it and had maybe an allergic reaction or you had a success, never did it. Or C, I would never do that. Joe, thank you for launching the uh, handouts. I see them in there and uh, uh, they're in there. There's two in there, ladies and gentlemen, docs tonight. Uh, uh, one is the full slides if you want them and the other one is six slides per page um, that are out there. All right, looks like we got a nice reaction here. Nice response. Thank you, everyone. Remember, this is interactive. So we have to reach a certain threshold, right, to remain interactive and live here. So thank you for participating. And you can see here, yes, 21% have done that. Uh, no, 62% have not. And we have about 16% that uh, said that they, uh, they would never do that. So let's talk about that a little bit and cross reactions. Uh, you know, penicillin, you know, it's usually the, if you want to say the haptin that's out there, that's kind of in the immunology side of things that creates the IgE, that immune response, that B cell, T cell allergic, then you have that, uh, you know, that mast cell degranulation. You know, if you're allergic to penicillin, it's that, usually that lactam ring that's out there is the haptin. Um, so you're going to be, you know, stay away from the penicillin category. We're going to talk about this 10% cross reaction in the cephalosporin, but there's seven generations now, and it's really just the 
first generation that we have to be concerned about. No really cross reaction with the macrolides. And then I've been to plenty of lectures where, oh my gosh, you're allergic to the sulfa, you know, uh, drug antibiotic. You can't use, you know, glyburide, glipizide, Celebrex, Diamox. And that's concerning. We have, you know, Joe on the, on the, on the call tonight and Joe's big in the neuro and, you know, Joe, like what happens, like if someone comes in and they have, you know, pseudotumor cerebral, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, you know, what's usually the drug of choice for that? The drug of choice that's going to be, it's going to be Diamox. But if a patient can't, uh, can't use it for some reason, and we'll, I know you're going to talk about, you know, who can, who cannot use it. There are other um, diuretics that can be used. So here we are, you know, we've been taught and you know tons of times that, you know, oh, they have an they have an allergic reaction to the sulfa antibiotic. You can't use diamox. And that becomes problematic because the answer is they probably can. And mm -hmm. we have, you know, 20%, you know, one fifth of our audience that says, you know, they've done something like that before. Or we've had people with sulfur allergy and they um they you know use trusoft, cosoft, which these are sulfa medication. So let's see if we can talk about that. So the sulfa antibiotic allergy, if it's a true allergy, what I've been chatting about, this IgE, oops, I got to capitalize that, that IgE mediated, causing hives, itching, congestion, lip and tongue swelling, tightness of the throat, bronchial constriction, maybe even moving into anaphylaxis. If you look down here at this structure of this sulfa antibiotic, see the S- the patient is not allergic to the S, right? It's this, uh, I always butcher this name, this uh, air, air, amiral amine ring. It's this whole complex right here. This is the antigen, right? It's the pollen. It's the cat dander. It's not the S. It's this group right here at the end that is the antigen. That's what the immune system, the mediated immune system goes through there. Sorry, the adaptive immune system goes through T cell, B cell, making antibiotics that react to this side right here. And that's where the confusion is. And so one of the, my uh, partners in my practice, uh, Dr. J uh, Justin Sherman, uh, he's like, hey, you know, he was a recent grad. He was a student of mine and we ended up hiring him at the practice. Um, he's like, here, we got this at school. Maybe this will help out. And what they're showing here is you can see this aromatic uh, amino group, which they have it circled here, but really I'm going to animate. It's this whole thing right here. This is that group. This is the antigen. So if a patient is allergic to this antibiotic, then obviously you do not want to use any of the antibiotics because they all have this group. But what happens when we go over here to kind of these, see here, here's the S right there. There's your sulfa medication. Here's your sulfa medication right here. And here's a nitrogen group and here's a nitrogen group. But notice how it doesn't have this aromatic amine group on it. This is why you're able to get away because it's not this sulfa here in these antibiotics that is typically what the patient, the antigen is. So that's how you're able to get away with things like Diamox and Neptazine, and we've used Trusop. Now, they could be sulfa allergic, so you need to be careful. So if you have someone that has a really bad sulfur allergy, but as Joe mentioned, you come in and they have pseudotumor cerebri, right? And you want to use this medication, you might want to do a test dose, right? On these patients. Someone comes and has glaucoma. You might just want to just put it in their eye and, and you know, for a, a, a day and see what happens. See if they, because if they have the antibodies, they're going to react, but they don't have this, this ring ray here on here. So it's safe. Now you could have someone that's truly allergic to Diamox. So when you go this way, you got to be careful because it could be a sulfur allergy. It could be this nitrogen, the, the nitric, uh, uh, nitrogen allergy. And, and in looking and going and searching and talking, we haven't been able in that Combs hypersensitivity, been able if they have a true 
diamox allergy or true sopt allergy to know what the antigen or that haptin is. So we need to be careful going to the antibiotics. But the, care, the key here is, you look how different sulfate, sulfite, sulfur products are. Atropine, gentamicin, timolol, wine, right? How many times, oh, I got a sulfur, a sulfur allergy to, uh, you know, to Bactrim. Bactrim right here, we use that one a lot. We're going to talk about, so I can't drink wine. Er, 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 that's not true that's out there. Um, you know, I can't use Azop. I can't use Diamox. Uh, minimally true, very low, very low truth, but it's all based on this organic chemistry that's here. So with that being said, you know, we started off with this patient that had this dacryous cystitis allergic to, to uh, uh, penicillin and, and Keflex. So uh, when we go here and we take a look, you know, this is one of my favorites. You heard me talk about it in my paradigm. Uh, it's amoxicillin and potassium uh, clavulonic or clavulonic acid. And this is what makes it that uber amoxicillin that's out there. When I started lecturing in the antibiotics years ago, I've had my colleagues say, Doc, I don't know why you use amoxicillin. I get treatment failure after treatment failure after treatment failure. And I said, that's because you're using amoxicillin. You know, I showed you that pus pouring out of that guy's eye or lady's eye for a reason, because we know that there's that beta lactamase in there, and that's what inhibits that beta lactam ring. And so, what happens is the potassium clavironate or the clavironic acid is absorbs that uh, beta lactamase. It has a higher affinity. You hear us talk about that in in pharmacology. It has a higher affinity. So now it allows the amoxicillin to go in there. Remember the bacteria. That's the defense mechanism but it literally almost absorbs, for lack of a better term, the beta lactamase to allow the amoxicillin to go in and kill. So that's why it does, works really well in eye infections, which are usually pus producing types of infection. So again, it, it's really easy. It kills everything, gram positive, gram negative. Um, it's good for 12 weeks old. It's good for geriatrics. Uh, that's out there. Safe in pregnancy, previous category B. The only thing you have to remember is watch for those penicillin allergies. And pretty much the adult dose here is 125. When you type it in, you do uh, augmenting, you're going to see 125, slash, oh, sorry, 500 slash 125. The 125 is the clavulonic acid. You're going to do that basically twice a day for a week. Sometimes these really bad lid infections I'll do twice a day for 10 days because it's hard, even though we're putting the pills in our mouth and our eyes here, it's hard to get through that blood brain barrier that's out there into the blood brain barrier, back out and get to the eye. So it's hard to treat uh, these eye infections. So sometimes I'll do 10 days. And you can see for children, you can see how to adjust the oral suspension, that 25 to 45 kilogram, uh, mill, uh, milligrams per kilogram divided into two doses. So again, it's good for gram negatives and gram positives uh, that are out there. We got our z pack. I saw z pack rolling in when we were talking about it. Remember, that's a macrolide antibiotic. It's basically the, uh, it's a prototype of azithromycin, but it's really the drug of choice for penicillin sensitive patients that are out there. So like taking a board's question, like what's the drug of choice for penicillin sensitive? I'm allergic to penicillin. Go with the azithromycin uh, or the, you know, the, uh, yeah, the azithromycin group, uh, which is uh, the macrolide group uh, that's out there. That's the, the answer would be macrolides if that was the question. And it's good for all ages. It's good in pregnancy. Uh, there's no renal adjustment if the patient has, you know, kidney issues. And I think we all know that there's a five-day z pack. you know, sometimes vitamin Z, people prescribe it left and right. For COVID, it was talked about a lot. But there's also a, a tri-pack. Um, if you know that there is an adult uh, z pack, it's basically you take two the first day and one pill the next four days. So four and two equals six. That's a six-pack. Uh, but if you do a tri-pack, it's just two, two, and two. So you can do it either way. I've done them both. Um, you just have to, you know, uh, just be careful. Um, the medication does have a long half-life. 
So that's why you do for five days, but it can be there for bio individuality, seven to 10 days in the patient um, that's out there. And you can see, I put the children's dosage in there, less than 16, 10 uh, milligrams per kilogram on the first day. And you can see five milligrams per kilogram day two through five. It's kind of an oral uh, uh, five day Z pack. You can see it's good for gram positive, gram negative, um, and it's better tolerated than the azithromycin and, and little GI upset that's out there. It is the drug of choice for chlamydia. Uh, so you, you know, one gram, four pills. If you think someone has inclusion conjunctivitis tested uh, out there, chlamydia, basically you just give four pills, right? That equals that 250, just give four pills all at one dose uh, with a big glass of water. And that's the treatment for uh, chlamydia. So I always use this as, as, a, as a joke. I was just in Vegas. These pictures are from a long time ago. Um, but, you know, just kind of a reminder, if you're taking tests and boards and this, this one doesn't need a test tonight, but, you know, the drug of choice for chlamydia uh, is one gram and that would be uh, azithromycin. So we talked, and it looks like something might have popped up here about, you know, AFib. Yeah, you got to be careful with AFib. You got to be careful with that with, uh, uh, with uh, the azithromycin or the z -packs. You know, same thing with, uh, uh, you know, those uh, cardiac issues when you're with the Cipro uh, that's out there. So just be careful with known cardiac issues with some of these medications. So now we're going to move into the uh, cephalexin or keflex. Remember, now we we talked about penicillin as a category. We talked about the... Uh, macrolides. Now we're going to move into, into the cephalosporins. Last time I chatted with Tracy, I believe she said there's seven, seven different generations that are out there within the, the cephalosporins. Um, really, I still kind of deal with generation one and generation two when it comes to eye conditions. Um, there is a cross reaction, depending on what literature you read, anywhere from three to 10% of penicillin sensitive patients. I'll explain that here shortly with my uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, organic structures that I have, I think on the next slide or two. This is the hey, first hey, gen. Actually, Greg, before yep. I just want you, you, this is a good time. A really good comment came in to, to me directly about telling a patient to get tested for penicillin allergies. Many were told by their parents they're allergic, but they're really not. You know, they, you've got the uh, the anaphylaxis, and then you got the upset stomach and nausea, and those are two different things. Any, any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely, Joe. And that's a great comment by that, by that audit, by that doc and making this live and interactive. Um, you know, first thing when I see allergies is, you know, and I have the technicians trained, you know, is to ask those questions for sure. Like a uh, diarrhea is not an allergy, you know, it's an adverse event, headache, uh, nausea. That's not true. Uh, IgE mediated the things that we talked about. The, the tongue swelling, the throat swelling, the bronchial constriction, the anaphylaxis that's out there. Those are just adverse, uh, adverse events. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you hear Tracy talk about, you know, that, yeah, I had a penicillin allergy because, you know, they took penicillin, but penicillin mm -hmm. does something with histamine and antihistamine and people that take it can get these little splotches, not hives, just these little splotches. And that's not a true, true penicillin allergy or hives that can occur. So that was great for bringing that up that's out there because, you know, who knows, someone might have a, uh, uh, an infection which it's resistant to everything but maybe penicillin and uh, it's penicillin sensitive to that bacteria. And you want to make sure that you have a true allergy that's out there. All right. So anything else, Joe? No. Okay. All right, so back to the third pillar now that we're going to talk about those cephalosporins, that first generation, good for gram positive, you know, maybe some studies out there saying better for gram positive than gram negatives and kind of in the scheme of things, children get gram negative, geriatrics get some gram negative, adults usually get gram positive. So that's why we usually see Keflex are used a, a lot in that, in that adult group that's out there. 500 milligrams twice a day for a week. It's safe in pregnancy. It's category B 
And sometimes you'll see people that have blowout fractures coming over from the ER, go see your eye doc. The, you know, over the weekend, they got into a car accident, bar fight or however they got there uh, with that blowout fraction. You'll see them on Keflex because even the emergency room docs know that this is the, the drug of choice if you have a fracture to the orbit. Just going to talk about a second generation. I'm not going to talk about all seven generations that are out there. I do this one because sometimes it's used in pediatric because it's a little bit better for uh, homophilus, influenza, gram negative. So I just put it out there. Sometimes you see it talked about in the literature, um, a child coming in, and this would be the available dosages uh, that are out there. You can see three months to 12 years, oral, uh, oral suspension, 15 milligrams per kilogram divided into two doses for 10 days. Um, also, you can do 125, 250, depending on uh, the child. So one of the best ways, you know, people ask me like, hey, doc, what age do you consider someone adult dose or or not? And probably the best answer that I can give you is, have they been through puberty, right? Or, you know, I had a 12 year old in the other day that I swore was 16 facial hair, you know, in the gym working out. And then the other day, I, I had a 13 year old in there. And my guess was did not go through puberty, right? So child dose for the 13, adult dose for the 12 year old. So that's kind of a nice little rule of thumb that's out there. You know, you can ask the parents and you know, say hey, puberty hit yet. And if so, you could probably, and if they're a nice body mass, you could probably get start going with some adult doses that are out there. That's why you don't see really ages, you know, it just says children uh, that are out there. So kind of use that as a rule of thumb. It's category B uh, that's out there. Now, cross reaction, I usually in a live audience, I'll say, you know, I'll give anyone to buy someone a beer later if they can tell me what these structures are but it doesn't really work so well in virtual. So uh, we could see here that this is penicillin. And what I point out with penicillin is you can see here that we've got this, you know, square-like structure, this lactam ring that's over here. And if you drop down to Keflex, you can see we still got this kind of nitrogen kind of box and this ring that's over here. You could kind of see if your body was an immune system and you, want, you know, had an adaptive immune system and it created uh, IgE to create this reaction, then uh, your body, your IgE could react to this or this, but you can see Ceftin is, doesn't look close to Keflex. And so your second, your third, your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generations don't look like penicillin. So that's why they're safe to use. And that's why you just be just be caution in this uh, in this uh, three to 10% of the patients that are allergic. So just keep that in mind. And if they're really, you know, if they're anaphylactic with penicillin and that beta lactam ring, you know, be careful with Keflex. You probably, there's a lot of other choices out there that we're talking about tonight. Now, remember, this used to be my fourth line because we'd always hear limited time, you know, limited use, last line of defense, you know, Stephen Johnson's reactions, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's used quite a bit. <clears throat> Joe introduced me to PCR testing. It's been great in the practice. And we've been finding resistance and sensitivities out there. And, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity try to try uh, methoprin. And the uh, sulfa methazola, uh, methaz methazola that's out there. So we've got it, you know, Bactrim double strength, I have it highlighted here, is what we use uh, most of the time uh, in the clinic. It, and you could just see there's single strength. I when talking with Tracy, you guys out there might have seen me lecture with the pharmacist Tracy Offerdahl. Uh, and I'll ask questions to her. Um, you know, do they keep the single strength? Not really. So a lot of times you're just going to prescribe Bactrim DS or double strength, which is 800, see double of the 400 and double of the 160, one tablet uh, by mouth twice a day. So it's a twice a day with the, the Bactrim. So star that one. If you're going down your list, can't use penicillin, can't use the macrolide, can't use, you know, Keflex. Now you're down to that fourth generation. That's a fourth pillar that's out there, but it works really, really well 
um, and there's not a lot, lot of resistance that's out there. You know, this is what we always heard, right? You know, that, uh, you know, there's a high incidence of Steven Johnson's and toxic uh, epidermal uh, necrolysis that's out there, T-E-N. Um, but you do have to remember that it is a category C. So you got to be careful uh, when patients are pregnant. And then, right, we always saw this cross-reaction with oral hypoglycemics and and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and Celebrex. Uh, in reality, that's not true, right? If they're allergic to the sulfa medication, the sulfa antibiotic, don't give any more without have that aromatic ring. That's the antigen. <laughs> it is probably safe. You got to be careful because there could be an allergic reaction to that other part of the molecule. So the oral hypoglycemics, the carbonic, Give a self a test dose. You know, we talked about the Azops, Trusops, and really like the 21% that's still being shared on there. You know, that's why we're able to get away with it because um, it's that's not the sulfa. The S is not what people are allergic to in the sulfa antibiotic. All right. This used to be the fourth line, but now it's really moved down to the last line of antibiotics. Really in my mind, you know, there's other ones that we can talk about, you know, there's clindamycin, Joe likes chloramphenicol that's out there. Um, but, you know, you can probably get through most of your clinic days by getting through with these five antibiotics, you know, it's, it's becoming the end line antibiotic. If you're allergic to penicillin, cephalosporins, macrolides, and you get it, they're really effective and they're broad, but they're getting a lot of adverse drug effects. Uh, that are out there. You also got to remember, you can only use these um, uh, in 18 years or old. And I got a really cool case that I might be presenting uh, in, in a few weeks for my anterior segment, this, this, this child, 16 years old, 16 and almost, no, he's 17, almost 18, um, came in and he's had uh, bacterial conjunctivitis for for you know, for two years, and Joe turned me on to PCR testing, and he has Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but then some Staph aureus through the roof, and some Propionum anaerobic bacteria, three of them. But the Staph aureus is probably causing the normal flora to go crazy, and really, it was he. And I'll show the PCR testing. It's basically, resistant to everything except the Cipro. And uh, we were going to prescribe it. I talked to Tracy, but then they said when they were trying to treat him for these two years, they used ofloxus in drops and it created them to have some type of adrenal rush. So I had to get them off to a disease specialist because I can't do IV or intramuscular and we'll maybe give the outcome on another, uh, on another webinar. But here we are with Cipro and Leviquin. If you're going to do Cipro, it's 500 milligrams twice a day for a week. Leviquin once a day for a week, you can see 500 milligrams. So Cipro is twice a day where Levaquin is once a day. But then you start hearing about these tendon ruptures. And then, you know, what about, uh, you know, retinal detachment, QT prolongation of the heart, photosensitivity, tendon rupture. These adverse drug uh, events, drug reactions are now starting to surface. And now that we see them 2020, move down to that fifth spot. So really, really a last line of defense if needed. You know, there's a lot of, you know, controversy out there. When it happens, you know, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. It's probably not yes or no. Uh, it's bio individuality. There's probably different collagens and elastins that are out there. You can give one dose and someone can get into tendon rupture that day. It's going to be rare that week, maybe. And it could be anywhere, you know, two or three years down the road. Um, but if you remember, you know, tendons are collagen and elastin, and so is our vitreous. So I, this is, I just point this out. And uh, I think this was surgical technique and maybe some fluoroquinolone. But, you know, there were some you know, fluoroquinolones being injected into the, into the posterior chamber in this dropless cataract surgery. I've seen other surgeons do it. But this is just kind of showing you, like, this patient really didn't have you know, a high myopic, you know, risk here, like not tilted disc, you know, I really don't see any lattice, but you could see kind of this nasty retinal detachment, you know, one hole, big horseshoe chair here, another hole down here. 
you know, we, you know I found a, a retinal horseshoe tear the other day on a patient and, you know, it was like tiny, small. Um, so again, I think this was uh, more maybe surgical technique, maybe exacerbated by the fluoroquinolone, but just, you know, just something out there to be aware of. Here was another patient. Again, we had a little run of them. I mean, we hadn't seen retinal detachments from cataract surgery in years, but what I did on this one is I turned on, I think the red free here, look at this big tear. You could see the water line coming down through the macula still on, but you know, this isn't a tear right here that you're going to miss this big giant tear. Again, was it surgical technique, the, the fluoroquinolone? I don't know, maybe both. That's out there. All right. And then we can go back to polling question number three, after talking about all that. Um, and this is multiple choice, which is good. So again, now you have this patient with this dacryocystitis and uh, it's pus producing and, but they're allergic to penicillin and Keflex, you know, which antibiotics, you know, would you use on this? Thank you for caught up on the questions. Great. All right, where are we sitting at? 8.49. All right, we got 75%. Let's see if we can get a few more rolling in here. And you can see that uh, we've got a nice, you know, a little attrition here. Um, hopefully it's not bad teaching here for some, and maybe some are just not listening and clicking the polling questions. Uh, but yeah, we have a shift in the answers here. We have, you know, azithromycin, a Bactrim is still in play. Cipro you could use, but uh, again, with all the adverse reactions out there, I'd probably not use that as much. Uh, Bactrim, you know, that is certainly a good choice, but obviously, you know, you don't want to give the medication if they have a, an anaphylactic type shock like uh, Keflex and then Augmentin that's out there. Uh, so, uh, but we did get a little shift down. We got the z pack bumped up, but again, you know, again, I don't think Bactrim is a bad answer or Cipro if you're just trying to kill the bacteria. Uh, just be careful with Cipro because of all the uh, uh, adverse events that, that can occur that's out there. What is BF when it says to avoid Cipro? Uh, use, use in breastfeeding and kids. Did I have BF somewhere out there, Amanda? What is BF when? Okay, yeah, breastfeeding is what, okay, I see what you're asking. What is BF? Yep, breastfeeding. Uh, that's out there, yep. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Jane Lee. All right. So let's see here. Remember to check for allergic, the patient is allergic to penicillin. We talked about treating this polytrim. You know, I did a Z pack here, but polling question number four is I didn't, you know, give you the full history here, but I'll do it here now. Um, this patient has come in. This is their fourth time, third time, uh, Joe, on the Weather Channel, they have Sarasota, Florida, 76 degrees, and uh, someone live there right now. Uh, but, uh, uh, but back to the webinar here, we have a polling question, and this is the fourth time. So this patient came in, is it contraindicated or indicated, uh, or is it both contraindicated and indicated at this current situation to do a dilation and irrigation? And I can tell you where this came from is, uh, you know, when when the states were passing the, the therapeutics 1990s through the you know, 2000s, I was lucky enough to be part of the, the teams that went out there and did some of these 100 hour, 80 hour, 50 hour therapeutics. And I would do the DNI station. I would do the foreign body, Ganeo and all these kind of workshops. And we'd say, OK, you know, what's the indication and contraindication? And we do DNI and. And we'd say, you know, oh, it's contraindicated to, to do a dilation and irrigation on a dacryocystitis. And, uh, and we'll end the poll here, see if we can get maybe some more answers in here, guys. So if you have a 
active dacryocystitis or you just have a dacryocystitis that is you know, chronic, and I'm going to give it the correct answer to, to everyone here. I'm going to end the poll. And maybe end the poll. Come on. There we go. Share the results. And really, all the answers are going to be correct here. Um, in this case, right now, we're at this pus producing, it's contraindicated. So, you know, the 47%, which is the majority here, you know, said it's contraindicated. Well, yeah, it's contraindicated. You don't really want to be trying to DNI this and push, you know, bug wherever and blow things out and spread infection. But we're going to use polytrim and Zithromax and a Z pack. We're going to kill this thing. And it's this patient's third or fourth dacryocystitis. So now it becomes an indication. So you can see that, you know, 38% of the people said, uh, you know, both, you know, all the answers are correct active, it's contraindicated. Once you resolve it, and this has been recurrent, now it's time to do a DNI. This patient I did a DNI on about, you know, 15 days into the therapy, they were all cleared up, no redness, not able to express, and they were blocked. And so that is what now solved the, the mystery in a sense. And we were able to get them off to uh, uh, an ENT or an oculoplastics. I think this one went to oculoplastics and had an external DCR. Remember there's external DCRs and endoscopic DCRs. You read the literature, external is a little bit higher, uh, but you have to break the skin on the outside, break some lacrimal bone. So uh, the patient wanted to go with a little higher success. So they saw they had an external DCR that was done. All right. So what group of antibiotics are we missing here? Uh, the group that we're missing are the tetracycline analogs. Boy, I got these uh, polling questions really in here firing away. So let's see here. So with that being said, when you use doxycycline or minocycline for dry eye disease, ocular surface and or meibomian gland dysfunction, whatever you want to call it out there, uh, you know, when we, ocular surface, dry eye, meibomian gland, what property of this pharmaceutical are we going for? Is it the, you know, are we trying to just kill the bacteria? Are we, it's got some protozoan action, like in for malaria? Is, you know, is it working uh, for the methic uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus? Are we trying to, you know, that's where that, you know, dry eye is coming from? You don't know, or is it the anti inflammatory action of the bacterial lipase? All right, let's let Justin in. All right. Looks like the audience has got this one down pat here. So with that being said, I'm just gonna end the poll. I'll share the results. And you can see here that the audience stuck this landing 90%. It's inhibiting that bacterial lipase that's out there. The, the, this, this medication, doxycycline, minocycline, has all of these benefits, right? It's an anti-infective. It's anti, you know, in a sense, for bacteria. It's an anti-prozoan. It's another anti-infective. It's good for, you know, still good for MRSA resistance. But we use it uh, in meibomian gland dysfunction. Um, or this evaporative type of disease uh, that's out there by its lipase uh, inhibition. So yeah, Greg, you, you, you've you been talking about the PCR uh, culturing. For the audience that, that is not aware of it, PCR is polymerase chain reaction culturing. It's sort of the new culturette. Uh, it's it's really very effective. It, it covers a lot of bugs and they do a pretty good uh, uh, sensitivity uh, testing as well. And, you know, Greg, I had a patient with an infectious keratitis this uh, about, about a week and a half ago. And, you know, she had several lesions, and I was actually a little bit worried about fungus, and this stuff does touch tests for fungus. And uh, I did culture her, and she came back actually with three bugs uh, in her cornea. Two were rare or unusual anaerobes, and one was a... Uh, uh, a pretty common stat, but she actually had had three, uh, three bugs, 
And the fluoroquinolone topically that I had prescribed was good for two of them, but not really for the other one. And when I went through the whole list, uh, the one that actually was uh, uh, covering the the other the other unusual anaerobe was uh, doxy, doxycycline. That's not you know something I would typically have uh, prescribed for an infectious keratitis, but when I added that, uh, she resolved pretty well. So culturing is out there for people. It's actually pretty easy to do, and uh, it's very effective. So I'm just going to change the the nomenclature because whenever I was talking to the lab, um, they uh, they yelled at me for calling it culturing um, mm-hmm. because culturing is in a sense growing and so on and so forth. And so like polymerase chain reaction is just kind of grabbing some DNA molecules and replicating DNA and studying DNA and RNA and all that. So um, this was talking to the lab geeks whenever I say, oh, yeah, I cultured it. They were, well, did you culture it or PCR it? And I'm like, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, culturing is you're growing things. And that's why it takes forever. We're doing polymerase chain reactions. So um, we can call it culturing because that's what we're used to. But just be careful out there. It's not in a sense. And when you talk to lab geeks, true culturing, that's all. And that's why it's so fast because you can get your results in about two days. Yeah, because you're not growing anything. Yep, that's really cool. All right, the audience now, uh, the last one. I'm not sure what's going on with the polling there. But what I wanted to point out here on this uh, test here or on this uh, slide was, you know, we talked about, and Joe just used a great example when he was doing PCR testing of finding that there was a bug that uh, that was susceptible to doxy or minnow. And we wouldn't think of that because we're so used to using it for my bomian gland. But when you use it for my bomian gland dysfunction, consider it a steroid in your mind. It does have an anti-inflammatory property because if we think of it as an antibiotic, we're just going to use it for a couple of weeks because we're like, oh, we're, you know, I'm just concerned. So it's got a lot of properties, right? Anti-prozoa, we got anti, we got the anti-infective. Then we got this kind of anti-inflammatory component, but that's at the low dose that's out there. High dose, anti-infective, low to Lyme disease, 100 milligrams twice a day, 40 milligrams once a day, nice little low anti-inflammatory. Think of it as a steroid that's out there. And I have this case um, that I've been showing for years. It's a 48-year-old man, comes in with the sandy, gritty, dry feeling. Basically, you can see he's a rosacea patient. Uh, He's got telangic tages. He got seam of his chin, his forehead, erythema of the cheeks, rhinophyma. Um, The the thickening of the skin here on his nose tells you that, that there's chronic inflammation. And, you know, it just hasn't started last year. So let's, or last week, you know, it's probably started last year. So here is a closer look. We see here uh, that we got this foam that's building up on his, on his lid margin. We got this inspissated, you know, that should be olive oil when you express it, but we got capped and inspissated meibomian glands. And then right here where this, in a sense, soap, these bubbles are sitting, irritates the the, the epithelium, breaks down the epithelium. The endothelial cells are pumping, pulling out the, you know, the cornea. So when the, that's how important the epithelium is, that when you get a break, things pull in. So you can see here, you have a, you get a break in the epithelium. That's why we get these marginal ulcers, these inflammatory ulcers uh, that are out there. So Joe, I see that you already answered the question there. How do I go about PCR testing? Um, That is the company that Joe and I both use. Uh, That's out there. Thanks for doing that. I I do still want to say what you should do is contact them. You'll set up an account, Reps will, a rep will come to your office and they'll get you all the materials that you need. It's the new age culture rep that you know, we used to use, but I can tell you that the swab is, you know, you can debris to corn you. So it's, uh, it's like a bro brush. They'll get you all set up. They'll tell you how to do it. Uh, they build the patient's insurance. They build the patient themselves. I can tell you, all those suspected keratitis that I thought might have been infectious, I always culture now. And uh, I always find out that they are virtually all positive. 
Yeah. So the key here too, in talking about it is remember, you don't have to keep things mm -hmm. alive, right? That's where culturing in a sense failed. Mm -hmm. You know, we would put them in the tubes, we'd send it over to the labs and they would try and grow it. And maybe the bacteria would survive or the pathogen would survive. The cool thing is again, if it dies, it's DNA, it's RNA is there. They can replicate it and, and, and figure it out. So really, really cool stuff. So worth talking about it and echoing it. So all right, so we're back to, you know, this patient. Our diagnosis of this patient is rosacea blepharitis, inflammatory blepharitis, meibomian gland dysfunction, evaporative disease, whatever you want to call, call it out there. We got some clogged up meibomian glands. So diagnosis, treatment, still with all the, uh, all the do studies and, you know, site sciences and their, you know, their heating of the lids and lipoflows and and, you know, IPLs that are out there, still one of the most undertreated conditions, but I think we might be taking that away here in a year or two as it's starting to get its, its respect and treatments that are out there. But, you know, a lot of times if I'm going to treat these patients with all these fancy, I still like the kind of condition that my bomian gland, and we can do that through a tetracycline derivative, which is minocycline or doxycycline. Let me go through this. This kind of shows you why and how. Um, Staph aureus and Staph epidermis, normal flora that you can pick up when you do the PCR testing. It's usually, you know, high because there's some other pathogen in there causing it to kind of go crazy. But these are normal flora that are found on the, and if you want to say the ocular, we talk about the gut microbiome, how about the ocular microbiome? I think you're going to find all these different microbiomes of the body. So you have the ocular microbiome and these produce lipase. There's that lipase we talked about. Now watch what happens to this whole chain of reaction. Lipase breaks down lipid. Lipid's what's in the meibomian gland. That's why your meibomian glands become turbid because lipase gets down into this gland and breaks up these oils. They start to become cloudy, then they become even thicker. And then we hear inspissated. And sometimes when you express them, it comes out almost like toothpaste. But if I told you I had some fat, some water, uh, and some lye, what would I say that's a cheap uh, form of? We would say soap, right? If you took fat, lye, and water, mix it together, you would get some bubbles. And so think about the eye here. This is truly soap. It's been proven. It's been tested. It's saponification. You're literally breaking down lipid fat in the meibomian gland, with this lye, so lye, lipase, paste, right? It's a cattle, it's an enzyme, ASE. It's breaking down lipid and we got lots of aqueous or water on our eye. And that's why you get the soap that forms. And then we talked about breaking down lipids. Well, phospholipid, 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 all jammed together is a lipid. So if you break it down, it's phospholipids. And we all learned about the arachidonic cycle. And then you have lipoxygenase and cyclooxygenase. So the cyclooxygenase is on this side, making the prostaglandins and thromboxanes. And then you have the, uh, the enzyme on this side, creating the leukotrienes. And then you have redness, mediators of inflammation, right? Leukotrienes, prostaglandins, thromboxanes, redness, swelling. And then leukotrienes recruit white blood cells. But that happens because... You have the soap breaking down the epithelium and then the endothelial cells are sucking things into the stroma. And then that's why you end up with this inflammatory reaction. So we've all used steroids, but in this whole scheme of thing, where do steroids work? They work right there. You're really not going after. And we have, you know, in this polling question, I still can see it here. Polling question number five, 90% of the audience said it's a inhibiting of the bacterial lipase. So what we're doing is we're inhibiting this right here. We're way up in this whole chain of reaction. So if we can inhibit this lipase or neutralize it or reduce it, then you don't get, you start helping out with the turbid inspissate meibomian glands. And that's why you give it at a low dose every day for these patients that are just you know, having trouble with meibomian gland dysfunction, evaporative disease, you're inhibiting way up here in this chain so that the meibomian gland does not become inspissated, does not produce the soap to break down the epithelium 
and you're using it to help control. So do I use steroids? Absolutely, I will. But I also like to use uh, something that's going to treat. This is this is when you hear, uh, you know, treating the symptom, you got a runny nose, give them runny nose medicine, got a cough, give them cough medicine. That's where the steroids are. If you're going to get down to root cause analysis, you want to be using, you know, something like doxycycline or minocycline to help inhibit that lipase enzyme. So that's why it becomes a drug of choice for this condition. I have antibiotic used right here as very small because we can use it, right? Joe talked about it. He used to use it for in a PCR testing. I used it in the Lyme disease patient the other uh, about six or eight months ago. And, uh, you know, we still use it out of the antibiotic MRSA patients. But in the case where we're using it a lot, we're using for its anti-inflammatory and anti collagenous and the good news is if they have kidney disease, you don't have to do renal adjustments that are out there. And you can see, depending on what you're trying to do, think of it as aspirin. Aspirin at, you know, 75 or 71 or whatever the milligrams is, it's 81 milligrams. It just came to me. 81 milligrams is antiplatelet. It doesn't really do anything for fever. It doesn't do anything for inflammation at that, at that dose. As you give it higher dosages, you get the antiplatelet, more antiplatelet at 325, maybe after someone had a heart attack. You want to take it for analgesia, for pain. You have to give it a little bit higher. You want to get it for the antipyretic, for the fever, a little bit higher. Inflammation is the highest. So depends on what you're going for here, but you know, 50 milligrams twice a day, you know, do 100 milligrams twice a day, you're going to get the steroid, you're going to reduce some of the bacteria uh, on the eye, some of those normal flora. And then you can kind of bring them down to a lower dose to, to treat the, the meibomian gland dysfunction. There is a, a 20 milligram that's out there. Um, I don't, I still think it's pretty, uh, pretty expensive. Uh, dentists use it a lot for, you know, for gum disease. That's why it's periostat. Um, you could just get a, a 50 milligram a uh, pill, but not a capsule, but a pill and get a pill cutter and tell the patient to, you know, to take, uh, take that once or twice a day. Again, it's at low dosages is what you need to treat this condition. So, you know, this kind of something that I threw out there, you know, inspissated, turbid, clear, start high. Think of it as a steroid. That's my point here. This slide, think of it as a steroid, start maybe a little higher dose and work your way down to 20, 25 milligrams. And then if you need a maintenance that's out there, you could do that for these patients. You know, Somebody asked, Mark, I'm okay. sorry, Mark asked, how long will it take for doxy to correct the, uh, the saponification? Yeah, it's a great question, Mark. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll use the steroid with the patients if they're going to go with the doxycycline. Um, so you can pretty much eradicate it and, you know, say in the next follow-up, um, which is probably going to be, I'll do a follow-up probably in about 10, you know, one to three weeks. Um, you know, I do follow up to make sure the patients are doing things the right way. Um, but you know, if you're just going to go with probably doxycycline alone, it's going to be based on, you know, probably, um, you know, how much inflammation, how much lipids being broke down, uh, by the bacteria. Um, so I'd say probably about two to four weeks, you could probably see a significant reduction, if not zero, uh, just with, uh, with it, uh, uh, issues with blood thinners. Well, I'm going to take a little rule of thumb from uh, my, my partner that I lecture with, Tracy Offerdahl. Um, you know, if it's Coumadin or Warfin, it doesn't matter if it's a multivitamin, whether it's doxycycline, whether it's aspirin or a hypertension medication or whatever, pretty much anything will cause Warfin or or uh, or Coumadin to react. These newer medications that are out there, there's you don't have to really worry about it uh, as much or uh, or at all uh, when, when it comes to these newer blood thinners that are out there. So um, you know, just so just be careful when you're trying to paint with blood thinners. I don't see Warfin and Coumadin used that much anymore, uh, but uh, there are some of the other uh, blood thinners that are out there, and you don't have to worry about it with doxycycline. But you'll see coming up here. And a slide or two, a few things to be concerned about. Um, so this guy was successfully treated. You can see here, I'm not going to go through this whole slide here, but, you know, warm compresses, uh, lid scrubs, threw some steroid on there. 
uh, but it was the minocycline that helped reverse this. And yeah, now there's all kinds of other treatments that you can do, IPL and Lipoflow and uh, um, Tear Science uh, has their you know open device that's out there. So you know you can then take it to the next level and really you know heat up the meibomian gland and express you know that that's out there like with Tear Saver or whatever you know instrument that you want to use. So. In the chat box here, I was going to put another polling question in here. You know, you get a call from the pharmacist, you know, you know, hemihyclate, monohydrate, you know, which one do you prefer that's out there? Do you prefer the, the highclate, doxycycline, highclate? Do you prefer uh, monohydrate? Like use the chat box that's out there. You know, you get the call from the pharmacist. Hey, uh, do you mind if I uh, switch this patient to monohydrate, doxycycline? you know, uh, 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 high clate tablet or pellet, or, you know, can I use monohydrate? What are you using out there? I see either, I see mono, I see both. Uh, and, and, and that's the answer that's out there for the people. People are saying monohydrate, that's the right answer. High clate is the right answer. Um, both is the right answer. And that's why, you know, you know, hope I didn't make you too thirsty out here. These are all vodka drinks. Right. So how do you want your vodka? You know, do you want uh, do you want it in a you know, ginger beer? Do you want it in cranberry juice? Do you do you just want a vodka martini? You know, all these different things are the delivery system. And that's what high clate and monohydrate are. And what happens is due to supply chains and even before covid, you know, you would prescribe, you know, 50 milligrams twice a day monohydrate, type it into the to the uh, to the electronic health record. And then the pharmacist would call and say, hey, uh, um, do you mind if we switch this over to to the high clade or vice versa with that story? And it doesn't really matter. They're both it doesn't really affect the efficacy of it. Um, it's just the delivery system. So, again, I just threw this kind of cute little a reminder out here is these are all vodka drinks. However, you're getting your vodka. Some people prefer orange juice, some people ginger beer, some people uh, like tonic. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's the vodka, right? That the that's the that that the people are going for. So it doesn't really matter in this case in the delivery system. So, you know, we were chatting about some adverse drug effects here. And, you know, can enhance the photosensitivity. So, you know, people that are already photosensitive, just remind them to make you maybe use a little extra sunscreen. Uh, this is a little cute cartoon here to remind me. Avoid in children and pregnancy. It's an old category D, so really bad, A, B, C, D. So you want to avoid doxycycline and the tetracyclines and the minocyclines that are out there. It can interfere with penicillin. Here it is right here. Coumadin, there's that blood thinner. But the joxin will affect Coumadin, uh, uh, Doxy, Penicillin, uh, all these things can really affect Coumadin that's out there. Um, and then we used to talk about this idiopathic intracranial hypertension uh, that was caused by this doxycycline. And, you know, we have showed a couple cases and Joe and I were talking about this. And I always tell the story, Joe and I were out at dinner and He's like, man, that was a really good case of that doxycycline and that idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And he goes, so what caused it? I'm like, oh, yeah, it was the minocycline that caused it. Joe. It was really cool. And he goes, OK, um, so what, what did you call that? The idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension. And we went back and forth, back and forth. I think, Joe, what are you trying to say here? He goes, why do you keep calling it idiopathic intracranial hypertension if you know that it's from the minocycline. It's more of a secondary. And I went, oh, so that's really on there. That's straight through because of my partner, Joe, there. Uh, and knowing that uh, this medication has a known side effect, it's really not idiopathic. We know what causes it. And if we stop the medication, uh, it will go away. There's hyper hyper hyperpigmentation that can occur from this. Um, and acids contain aluminum, uh, aluminum, calcium, magnesium, and all of these are, in a sense, positively charged and can uh, really affect this medication. So if they say that makes their stomach upset, be careful with milk. Be careful with uh, uh, those uh, N acids out there that can, in a sense, neutralize it. And it's the same thing for seizure medications like barbiturates. Uh, and you can see the list here of medications that can cause that. So just be aware of that. 
uh, that kind of goes back to our our person that was asking about uh, the uh, about the the blood thinners a little bit earlier. So I'm going to start polling question number six, and I'm going to launch it. Doxy and MS. I'm guessing you're saying multiple sclerosis relationship. Um, I don't know of any doxy and MS relationship. And whether you're Dave, if you're mentioning it for cause or being used as a treatment, um, I don't know of either one. But if you want to put it in the chat box, or if anyone does know, or Joe, do you have any idea where we're going with that? I think you were talking about, you know, it's the minocyclines can cause uh, a, 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 a pseudo tumor. Uh, Srebi issue. Uh, it's it, the the evidence is actually I, I think fairly weak. It it, it is it, it is not anything that is well uh, well established to my knowledge. So it looks like doxy and MS cause thirty to fifty year old females. You know I've learned a lot in my integrative and functional that you can't really say never and ever anything about in medicine. Um, you know so there could be a subset of uh, bio individuals out there that with this medication creates maybe some type of demyelinating event. Um, but, you know, Joe's does a lot of neuro. It doesn't seem to be high on the radar list. Uh, but uh, certainly I would say, you know, probably not off the, you know, uh, probably anything can happen. So. All right. Polling question number six here. Let's see where we got. We're good with the results. So I'm just going to end the poll. And the question is, have I seen a patient with optic nerve head edema from doxy and minocycline? Looks like 8% have and about 86% haven't. So, yeah, I'm going to just say, you know, take a little closer look. Um, we have a five OD practice. I'm only three days a week. My wife's about three days a week, two and a half, three. Um, we have a part-time doc. We have a couple docs full-time. So yeah, full-time equivalent real quick in my head, just doing that three and a half full-time. And we probably see it once a quarter or every you know four months so you know a third you know a third of the year every three you know three times a year um so just be careful that it's out there um maybe not that you've caused it but i see a lot of uh patients coming in they're taking you know minocycline doxycycline for acne adult rosacea so on and so forth um we've had two cases this year so we're right on track for our two to two to two to three uh, that's out there. So just be aware of uh, that, uh, that this medication can create um, uh, optic nerve head edema. And you know, here's a case right here. This is an older case. You're going to see with the dates, but I left the dates in there for your timeline. But it's something very similarly happened just recently with, uh, with the people that they're with the ones that we've had this year. Bilateral swollen optic nerve heads, Joe, I know I like to ask you this, um, but you know, does this patient coming in taking minocycline with this being, you know, I feel Joe in my gut feeling it's minocycline, doxycycline. Does this patient need to go to the ER, need to go to the hospital, get an MRI? Um, or can I just say, you know what, I think it's the minocycline. Well, a person like this may not need to go right to the hospital. I mean, if that, if if you're willing to work with the uh, the ER physicians, uh, you can have some good collaboration. They they do need imaging. They 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 do need testing, and you know something like this. I think you you can stop the doxycycline, the minocycline, but they need the evaluation. That includes an MRI and our MRV. And quite possibly a lumbar puncture because we want to make sure that there's no, uh, you know, there's no infection going on. So they need some CSF studies. It, you know, you you you've got a probable cause, but it would be a diagnosis of exclusion. So you'd have to exclude all the other possibilities. And I always remember people who are using tetracycline drugs can still develop uh, intracranial infections and brain tumors. 
And I think that's probably the, the, the line that sticks with me the most is that a patient, and I think you said that to me one time, is a patient can have more diseases than just one. So even though you think that's the probable cause, they could still have a brain tumor. They could still have an infection. So you're the one that I give, always give credit to. Sorry, it's probably what it is, but you're allowed to have more than one disease that's out there. So they all kind of get worked up. So here's this bilateral swollen nerve head. Um, we're going to check blood pressure in the office, right, Joe? And then, you know, start looking into some of the other causes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see here, we uh, here we are with August 19, 2010. Just 12 days later, you could see the swelling start to, to go down just by discontinuing the medication. 25 days later, you could see maybe the right optic nerve is, in, you know, in a sense, almost back to normal. Left is still a little bit swollen, has some edema. And you could see that by day 48, as a reminder, what they looked like 48 days ago, the swelling has gone away. So secondary uh, idiot, secondary idiopathic, ooh, secondary intracranial hypertension uh, that's out there. You know, again, I see these quite a bit. So um, here I am, you know, just following the patient. You can see here's another patient that came into the office, swollen, less swollen in a sense, you know, maybe back to normal or almost back to normal. We see them quite a bit. When I do see them again, look at the swelling here. If we would run that OCT, Joe, we'd get that Patriot sign you talk about. And you could see we got the medication, but they had a full workup, right? They needed worked up. Um, they didn't have those other diseases, infections and tumors and, and so on and so forth. And we were able to stop the medication and now call it secondary to the minocycline. Uh, and get this patient, uh, you know, their their nerves from being swollen. Yeah, the the worst thing that can happen, and unfortunately, I have seen this done by colleagues, is they have a presumption of pseudotumor, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, and not you know, it, maybe not it, it just tell them to stop the minute, but they put them on diamox without doing the evaluation, and that uh, that is that is potentially deadly. I mean, you can have a supposition and and, and a strong a strong sense of what it is, and you want it to be that, but we still have to to rule out the other things. And I gave an example today. Uh, we had I had a fresh third nerve palsy come into uh, to the office, which is uh, you know kind of a rude thing to do during a hurricane <laughs> because <laughs> uh, it's hard to to get to get that worked up. And you know, based upon the clinical picture, my you know my belief of an aneurysm is actually very very low. But I, you know, we still sent him uh, to rule out a posterior communicating artery aneurysm for a CT and a CTA. I think it's going to be nor I think it's going to be normal, and that this is ischemic. But yeah, I still can't uh, I can't obviate the fact we got to look for something bad. So great points to drive home all of these reasons to what we do and why we do it. In a sense, don't take shortcuts. Um, we have a question that rolled in here. Is there an amount among that you see that seems to increase the prevalence of that? Um, these have all kind of been uh, acne rosacea patients. So 50 milligrams once or twice a day, kind of using it you know, as kind of that steroidal, but it was more length uh, out there than rather dosage. So, you know, they've been on it. They have patients say, that can't be the reason. I've been on this for 18 months. So it seems to be that 12, 18 month, two year duration where they start, you know, probably, you know, something inflammatory or anti-inflammatory changing and, you know, creating that, that, that pressure to go up in there. So it's more duration uh, rather than dosage that's out there. And, and, mo and most likely it, yeah, there are susceptible individuals who we, we don't know who they are. We can't identify it. But these drugs seem to inhibit the uh, the arachnoid villi from uh, from absorbing cerebral spinal fluid, and that's why the pressure goes up. And uh, you know, talking with Tracy, that's what you know. Some of these uh, genetics testing, you know, someday we might know who's going to be addicted to opioids and who wouldn't be, and so on and so forth. So stay tuned with some of the genetic factors that are out there. That's you know exciting uh, potential to to know who to give some medications to and who not to. This was pretty neat. This was an OMG. I walked into the room and I said, you know, hey, uh, you know, Samantha, you know, uh, you know, great to see you. What are you in for today? And she's like, oh, I'm here to get my, my bone and gland dysfunction check, doc. You know, that was whether she said that, but that's what she was there for. And I said, how are everything? How's everything going? And she said, everything's going great. 
Um, I said, you know, anything you know, I need to know about anything changes. And she's like, no, life is good. Other than the fact they can't figure out. And she had long pants on and, and uh, like patients don't come in and take their shoes off and kick their legs out like this. But she's like, she pulls her pant leg up and she says, Hey, uh, check out what's happened to my legs here. And I literally went like this and said, Samantha, this is, you know, um, you know, I caused this. And she goes, what are you talking about? She goes, remember when I told you about, you know, when you give doxycycline and cause your nerves to swell and hyperpigmentation and affect some of these medications and da, 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 da. And she goes, yeah, but you mean this type of pigmentation? I said, and that's it. So you could see here, I had her take her shoes off, pull her pant legs up a little higher so I can get a good picture of it and have her stand up and kind of see, it looks like she stepped in tar. And you can see here, we just decided to stop the medication and you can see her legs started to fade over time. Um, and this is where she was uh, before. And uh, this is where she is uh, about a year later. Um, and you can see as a reminder, there's where she was. So, um, you know, I always tell the audience when I do this live, you don't trust me, just type two words, go to Google, go to Dr. Google, type in minocycline hyperpigmentation, hit enter, just those two words, minocycline hyperpigmentation, doxycycline hyperpigmentation, hit enter, and then click on images and you'll see all kinds of images. And I like pointing that out because, you know, I see patients coming in, right? I see patients coming in. I look at their optic nerves. I like to see if they're not swollen. And I ask them if they have any pigmentations in their body. Because it doesn't mean that I started it, but it's just a reminder of me plugging in, uh, being a part of the healthcare team, right? That's where I think our, our, our system gets thrown under the bus is we're all these individual silos. I see a cardiologist, pulmonologist, this person, that, 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 you know, we kind of have to kind of all work as a team. And I've had people come in and say, well, you look at my uh, fingers, doc. Is this what you're talking about? I'm like, yeah, you might want to bring it up to your prescribing doc uh, that's out there. So really anywhere in the body, these pigmentations uh, can occur. So this is just in here more for completeness. We're not going to really uh, prescribe these as, uh, as optometrist in a sense. This is more, um, you know, for kind of the resistance that's out there. But uh, there was a, a fluoroquinolone antibiotic for acute skin infections and skin care. There really haven't been new antibiotics out for a while. Uh, that one was approved in 2017 and is, you know, now on the market. In 2018, a new tetracycline antibiotic, you know, approved with patients with bacterial skin infections and the community acquired bacterial pneumonia. Um, you know, again, you might see these, you might hear of them, but, you know, we're not going to really be prescribing these uh, in a sense yet for our patients. We don't want to create the, the, the resistance. And again, 2018, another tetracycline uh, 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 medication uh, came out. And then in 2018, so we had all the doxycycline, tetracycline, all the years, uh, minocycline. And then in 2017, 18, all of a sudden, all these new uh, tetracycline antibiotics hit. And again, you can see this one's just IV. Uh, and you can see for the treatment of intra-abdominal infections in adults. I mean, again, it makes sense why it would be IV only there. <clears throat> That's out there. So with that being said, you know, for this next, you know, say 15 minutes here, I just kind of want to go in and talk about, uh, we talked a lot about the antibiotics, but let's shift gears here and give a little bit of love and play to the uh, oral uh, uh, herpes medications. You know, Valtrex, Acyclovir, Famvir, those are kind of your oral herpetic medications. But if you think about it a little bit, you also have Neurotin, Lyrica, Doxycycline, again, for the anti-inflammatory L-lysine that's out there to help with uh, that immune, that amino acid group. Um, and, you know, Tagamet, maybe for the, for the uh, off-label use of the virus side of things and tricyclic antidepressants, uh, like amitriptyline, maybe for the, uh, for the uh, neuropathic uh, pain that can occur. Uh, the tri, you know, the trigeminal neuralgia. So when you talk about orals in, uh, in for, for, you know, herpetic disease, when we're talking about <clears throat> fighting the infection, we're talking Valtrex, acyclovir, and famvir, but we have Neurotin and Lyrica again for that post herpetic neuralgia, doxycycline, and all these other ones. So those are kind of maybe all the orals that are out there, but just some used for different reasons other than the, the anti-infective. So some fun facts about herpes. They're the leading cause of human viral disease. 
you know, let's take out COVID at the time being a pandemic. It's the second leading to influenza and cold viruses. This came up because someone said, hey, you know, my dog has herpes. Can I get herpes? I'm like, I don't know. That's a great question. I was, but, you know, I was a geek and, you know, couldn't wait to get on the plane and try and figure it out. And then as I was doing that, I found out that there's 130 different types of herpes viruses out there. But the good news is only eight of them affect humans and five of them affect the eye. So that's what we hear herpes simplex one and two. We got the shing or the, uh, yeah, the shingles as the zoster, then Epstein-Barr, and then cytomegalovirus. And, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, one, and, uh, by age uh, four, 25% of the population will test seropositive, and they check for the antibodies for the herpes simplex or the herpes zoster that's out there. By age four, I'm sorry, herpes simplex that's out there, by age four, we... 21 in four children will tell that's how ubiquitous this 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 infection is and then i bet everyone in on this webinar if you're seeing patients would test positive it's just our immune system just kind of keeps it at bay uh that's out there so we've all been affected by this uh by this by this herpes simplex and we can see here that again there's the eight that can affect the eye uh, the herpes, they call it herpes human uh, virus one through eight. You could see herpes, herpes, and zoster. And they, 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 you're going to see here, and these ones are the ones that can affect the eye. This is the human body. This is the eye. So cytomegalovirus, we know that one, Epstein-Barr. But these ones here are the one we're more familiar with. But what's really cool about these, and you can know this caused vitritis, but do these ones cause vitritis? It's basically where the latency is, right? So the latency of herpes one and two simplex, the human virus, right? Human herpes virus, it's a neuronal disease. It hangs out in the neuron along with, with zoster. And that's why we get those dendritic patterns and the trigeminal outbreaks that we see when they're on the face or on the body with shingles. But if you look, the Epstein bar and the cytomegala, they kind of hang out in the immune. It's kind of weird, right? We think about B lymphocytes, talk about the Trojan horse and monocytes, you know, they kind of hang out in there. And so whenever the you get an infection somewhere and the B lymphocytes and the monocytes come in, well, sometimes you can bring in the Epstein-Barr virus and the cytomegalovirus, kind of where it's hanging out, where it likes to be, uh, where its latency is or where it just kind of hangs out. So that's why we see them as kind of neuronal and pattern uh, that's out there. So herpes simplex keratitis, leading cause of cornea vision loss, cornea loss in the United States. I didn't say Jamaica. I didn't say third world countries. I didn't say wherever. I said the United States. It's the leading cause of corneal vision loss, right? So we all know like, you know, this disease, the, this vascular disease is the leading cause. And this one, this leading cause of corneal vision loss in the United States is, uh, is herpes simplex. We've got the infectious side, we've got the stromal side, endothelial side, and then neurotrophic keratopathy, which is now nice because, you know, Dompe has a nice medication out there for, uh, for that called Oxervate. Actually, Greg, can you step back for one second, please? Absolutely. Uh, describe what you mean by endothelialitis. endothelialitis. Yeah, so... Um, you know, a couple, couple hypotheses, I guess, out there of how the endothelium becomes inflamed. Um, and what happens is the virus makes it to the level of the endothelium. You get that little immune reaction. And what happens is the, the cells aren't working properly. So you kind of get some localized type of uh, uh, swelling in that area. It doesn't have to be the whole cornea. It could be a little area. And you might even see a little low-grade uh, iritis or maybe a little some KPs in that area. Uh, that's what endotheliitis is. And might, and might you see some folds in Decimase membrane? Yep, absolutely. Yep. If, if, you don't, if, you, if you can indulge me for a minute, I want, I want to make a public service announcement. Yeah, please. Uh, a condition, and my, my, wife, my wife had this, uh, had a patient like this uh, about a week, a week and a half ago. 
And she was describing it to me as, you know, this endotheolitis, and she thought it was herpes, and the patient had these folds and in, in decimase and edema's cornea, but the epithelium was completely intact. And she uh, put the patient on an oral antiviral and was telling me about it, and I said, give the patient a call, pull up her number, and ask if she's a lepidopterist. Now, for those of you who may not know, lepidopterists are people who are butterfly enthusiasts. And lo and behold, she was. And monarch butterflies are, are poisonous, and they're poisonous because their caterpillars eat something called milkweed. And there's a unique condition that mimics herpes. It's milkweed toxicity. I've probably seen uh, about three in the last uh, two months. And these are people, they, they, they handle this milkweed, they touch their eye, and they get this endotheliolitis. Epithelium, I mean, I had a patient who had, had some uh, uh, microcystic cor uh, epitheliopathy, but it's a stromal edema. The epithelium is generally is intact. They have these massive folds and decimase membrane. You don't know what it is. Ask if they're into butterflies, milkweed, gardening, every case. They were handling milkweed, they touch it, they get this unique uh, toxicity that is just an endotheliolitis. You may think it's herpes, it's not. Very, very steroid uh, responsive. That's does just it, kind of my... Hmm? I was just going to ask, does it look like almost like the, uh, like maybe the post uh, edema after cataract surgery because... Very, the, the very much so. Is that what it would look like? That's that's yeah. interesting. That's a good one. Very, very much so. It's not well known. It happens a lot. Like I said, at least here, we have a lot of lepidopterists and, or people who are out there uh, handling milkweed, touch themselves. It's toxic. It, it is confusing. But if you see that really, really dense uh, stromal edema with, with uh, folds and decimase, but the epithelium is intact, go for that history. And there's your answer. Yeah, Jay, no you always cease, cease to amaze me. You know, I would have thought that that was someone that treats uh, treats leprosy. So. Yeah, lepidopterists or, or or leprechauns. So, but uh, but no, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I guess when we went to and uh, wherever we were, I think in Florida, we went through that butterfly area. So, I, was I being a lepidopterist that day? Yeah, uh, I guess we were. And people yeah. ask me treatment prep for it, steroid and, and any good steroid. Yeah, it's inflammatory. It certainly sounds like yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Good. Good indulge. All right. So let's jump in here. We got herpes zoster uh, that's out here, that herpes human virus number three. We can see, I thought this was really cool. This lady came in. She wasn't sure. Felt like it was things crawling in her skin. Really, I pushed the microscope away and got up close. And it wasn't until I saw this right here that I figured out, oh, look at this. This is neuronal. I'm being such a geek. But doesn't that look like a dendrite on the patient's cornea if I would just put some staining on that? So I knew exactly what was going on. This is when we want to catch these zoster uh, patients, and we want to catch them early like that. I mean, usually at this, by this point, when the scarring's coming in, um, the, the virus has been neutralized by the body, right? It created the interferons, and it started to, to neutralize that virus. So with that, I'm going to do, oops, I guess I still have polling question number six that was still on. So let's do polling question number seven. We're getting close here, so I'm going to make this quick. So please respond quickly. I'll make sure I get through all the, the herpes slides here. Did you ever wonder why a primary care physician sends you a herpes zoster patient? They're already on, say, prednisone, uh, uh, I don't know, a Medrol dose pack and Veltrex. They, you know, they come in like this right here. Hey. You know, I got this patient uh, that, that's that's here um, uh, and the primary care doctor sent them over well, and you can see well. these. Let's see. Let's see. Right there. Hold on a second. Let's see which one it is. All right. Oh, maybe not. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, you know, what's this primary care doc doing? Testing me? What's going on? Or what the heck they want me to do? So... All right, I'm going to end the poll, share the results. And yeah, it looks like, you know, it, it has happened. Uh, and uh, to a lot, quite a few of the audience here, um, no, it's never happened to some. And uh, um, that's out there. So let's uh, take a look.
Here's the reason why. I was talking to a primary care doc. As you see, Joe and I are very, you know, we, throughout the year, we always say you got to be involved. Talk to ER docs, talk to primary care physicians. I think that's probably one of the greatest weak breakdowns of, 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 of our health care system is that we don't really participate at the level maybe that we should be. But this doc was, right? This doc sent it over to me. And what they learn in school is, you know, especially if they got something on the tip of the nose, but the ocular findings for zoster that they're taught that they have to memorize is episcleritis, scleritis, keratitis, uveitis, iris atrophy, glaucoma, vitritis, retinitis, choroiditis, optic neuritis, and cranial nerve palsies. So this patient is not really here to confirm the uh, to confirm the diagnosis and treatment. What they want you to do is because it's the leading cause in a sense of the SERP uh, uh, simplex, but still it could be a leading cause of vision loss. As you can see, this eye is involved. Do they have this episcleritis, uveitis, vitritis, choroiditis, the retinitis, uh, or do they have a cranial nerve palsy that's out there? So all they want is a good little ocular examination, dilation, look in the back, bill appropriately, and send them a, uh, a nice report. Usually, yeah, we, that, ask that, to that happens. That happens Can't to me do. all the time, Greg. They, you know, they they want they want our blessing. They want they want somebody to take a look that they can't see the treatment. Most of the treatments are already being done, but they may need a little bit extra with uh, with a glaucoma medicine or a, a topical steroid or cycloplegic. So it's it's good co collaborative care. And then Nancy reported here, uh, I usually am asked to evaluate the cornea on these patients. Absolutely, because that's the, you know, we're, you know, number one cause of corneal vision loss. But, you know, just also take it to the next step further that, you know, we know that these other things can happen. So we're just going to give them a complete ocular examination and report all those findings back. So uh, they are covering their bases in the patient care. Absolutely. Uh, that's what they're doing. Uh, an OMD I work with prescribe antibiotics and erythromycin ointment along with Valtrex for herpes simplex. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know the prescribed oral antibiotic drops and erythromycin ointment along with Valtrex for simplex lesion. I think you can get away with the, with the, with the Valtrex and maybe antibiotics and maybe be a little bit over unless the patient's immunocompromised. So it's, I'm not going to paint with a broad brush, but I do a ton of herpes simplex and in the area. And, uh, you know, unless I'm thinking that there's a, <laughs> a secondary infection or something else going on, I don't really cover them with erythromycin ointment and antibiotic drops, maybe on some of these lesions, but you, you, I think you mentioned simplex here. So simplex really doesn't cause this. Maybe on some of these zoster infections, I might cover them with maybe like a triple antibiotic, but um, this may be something to keep them moist uh, That's while they're going through the healing process. Great questions. And this is what makes it live and interactive. Thank you. All right. So back to the, uh, to this is that, you know, these are clear through the kidney, kidney, kidney. So I'm going to keep saying that I'm going to go through these medications pretty quickly so that I can get through all the slides and then we'll land this all right on time. So there's three medications out there. You know, there's Val or there's uh, acyclovir, which is Zovirax. This is what we grew up on. You know, 800 milligrams. It comes in two, four, eight, and IV. 800 milligrams five times a day. They're poorly absorbed in the GI, so you kind of have to give a ton of it to push it through, right? That's why you do four grams a day to get it through and get it into the circulation to go beat up on that bug. If you're going to do maintenance, as we learned from the herpetic eye disease study, you're going to do 400 milligrams twice a day. Again, caution in, re in, in the uh, impaired renal function. And if you're going to go long term, as the herpetic eye disease study told us, contact the PCP, the same PCP that said, hey, check this out. Now you're going to go long term on these simplex patients you know, different patient, I get it, but you're going to call the PCP back and say, can you check their kidney function tests? Uh, Cause they're going to go, you're going to go long-term. You're going to go a year, maybe two years uh, to reduce their herpes simplex uh, uh, that's out there. Just make sure, remember kidney, kidney, kidney that's out there. Good news is look, category B, safe for pregnancy. 
Now, when you use it for uh, uh, Valtrex and Famvir, you're using it off-label. That's not a big deal. It's approved for genital herpes, but corneal specialists use it. We use it all the time. There's plenty of literature out there that says support it. So don't get too caught up in that, ooh, you know, you know acyclovir is at least uh, approved. So is, in a sense, Valtrex, and so is Famvir through the studies, just not in the PDR, for lack of a better term. Don't really use Famvir that much. Um, it's really fallen off. Uh, it's no longer available uh, via Novartis as a brand name. It's generic. You could use it. Uh, it works. All these medications work well for the virus, so whichever one you want to use, but I'm going to show you a little tidbit here why you might want to use Valtrex and just keep things simple. Now, if you look, Val acyclovir is a pro drug of acyclovir. And all you need is a thousand milligrams three times a day. Well, you reduced it by a thousand. That's 3,000 milligrams versus 4,000 milligrams. It's good for herpes simplex one, two, and zoster virus. Um, again, you're going to do uh, a thousand milligrams uh, uh, for a week, a thousand milligrams three times a day for a week, which is three grams. Again, caution, Famvir, caution, acyclovir, caution, a, uh, Valtrex, if they are renal impaired. And if you're going to do a 500 milligram uh, dosage to maybe help reduce the reoccurrence as the her herpetic eye disease two study taught us, then make sure you get the patient's kidney functions test by the PCP. Now, along with uh, dosing, and this is where I'm going to kind of show you why I like to do Valtrex. And you don't have to follow my lead. This is just trying to show you things that are out there. But the herpetic eye disease study, the main reason for stopping and dropping out of the study was GI side effects. And a little bit was rash, but it was GI side effects. Remember, right? It was 400 milligrams twice a day, trying to see if it would help out. And we know the answer came out to be yes. It helps decrease the reoccurrence. But, you know, the number one reason that people dropped out was due to, uh, due to GI. So with that being said, which of these, I'm going to stop sharing here. I'll do one more polling question. Let's see if I can get them. The, Joe, you might have to get that launched. Yeah, I'll, get up, I'll get up for you. Frozen here. You know, no worries. Which, Hold on. Thank you. Which... Oral antiviral is lactose free. I might have helped you by getting the uh, the answer there, but uh, with that being said, do you have any concerns using with diabetics and uh, renal problems? Uh, you know, the question is how. So the answer is going to be yes, but diabetes is a whole spectrum, right? Are they controlled? Are they well controlled? Are they brittle? Have they you know, do they have vascular disease, retinopathy, neuropathy, you know, nephropathy? So the answer is going to be yes, I'm going to have a concern, but this is where I'm really going to plug in and work with the uh, with the primary care. Like all you guys might not know where that question came from. That was a direct message to me. It says, are you, oh, no, that one was not direct message. This is another one that just came in. Are you treating corneal simplex with oral medications only or, or no and no topical? Uh, I'll let you know here in a second, John, on my next slide. So you'll see uh, what I'm doing here on my next slide. I think I have it in here. So I'm going to end the poll. We're going to share the results. And here's the key right here. If you guys are geeks and work with a pharmacist, you'll see that it says lactose. And that was probably the main reason why the people dropped out of the herpetic eye disease study. And you can see down here, Famvir, right here, Famvir lactose but there's no lactose in the Valtrex. So I pretty much just use Valtrex when I'm treating the patients. Um, I had a patient came in that she couldn't be more than uh, uh, 80 pounds wet, maybe 90 pounds wet in the shower. She was 90 years old. Um, and acyclovir, valcyclovir, it's pretty similar, right? So Famvir is a little bit different in its chemistry. Uh, these two have the highest amount of agitation or hallucinations that's out there. So just be aware of that and consider uh, FAMVIR in your older patients if you're trying to avoid that. 
All right. So what about this? This goes back to the question I got from John in a, in a, in a private direct message. You know, am I am I treating corneal simplex with oral uh, medications only? So what happens if you've got this dendrite right over the pupil and you call the pharmacy and you prescribe Xergan and go, well, I can't get that to 24 to 48 hours. I got to get it from the, you know, from the uh, from the warehouse. Same thing with Viroptic. Man, we haven't had Viroptic here for years. So can you go orals only? In this case, I would probably do orals only, maybe add an amniotic membrane to get something because it's over the center pupil. So is there uh, any difference in efficacy by going just orals only? Right here, you got this herpes simplex, and this is going to answer your question here, John, is that you know studies have been shown. There's a study here, 60 patients. There's other studies out here that have been shown. This is the Cochrane collaboration saying that uh, uh, oral acyclovir alone uh, appears uh, to be effective as topical. Now, here's my rule of thumb. I do orals only as long as it's not over the center pupil because it's the leading cause. I'm still a little bit babyish in a sense. Sometimes it's Zircan, sometimes it's Viroptic, sometimes it's Regenerize, sometimes it's an amniotic membrane. But kind of my rule of thumb is if it's got a dendrite over the pupil, yes, I do orals and usually something else. And that something else could be a long list is what I just said there. And watching this closely for reversal and then adding the steroid in there to try to minimize the amount of scarring that's out there. So there's a lot of, if you want to say evidence-based medicine that is in the epithelial keratitis, there seems to be an equivalence or equal to using just orals only. So yes, am I treating with orals only at times and most of the time, yes. I think this is my last slide here, which will get us landed right on time. It's not really orals, but we get a lot of questions when we do this. What about uh, um, uh, vaccines? Uh, and Syndrix is basically has replaced Zostavax. It has a much higher. So if you're going to get vaccinated for Zoster, it's going to be Syndrix. I don't even sure if Zostavax is even out there. One was a live vaccine, and this is replacing it with more of a recumbent uh, intramuscular type of vaccine that has an adjuvant to it. So with that being said, stop sharing. Uh, I'm just going to see if there's any more, uh, any more questions here. This is why I put this in here so I can scroll through. Joe, it looks like we're pretty good on the questions, right? Um, I now feel yep, more comfortable prescribing. Are. Okay. So I'll get this question through here quickly so we can get this landed right on time. <laughs> All right. And that was big, helping to make this live and interactive. So I'm going to end the poll. Got everything caught up there. I just kind of used that. I'll stop sharing. I'm glad it helped out 99% of the people. So with that being said, I don't see any more questions out there. I want to thank everyone for attending. This was oral antibiotics and antivirals and eye care. Uh, it was a truly an honor and pleasure to deliver this along with the co-host here tonight, Joe, and his, and his, uh, and his uh, 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 insights in uh, that great case on the milkweed. Uh, Joe, any other comments before we wrap up the CE and move into some housekeeping? No, no, I thought it, I thought it was great. Uh, you really hit uh, a lot of good, strong pharmacology, reminding people uh, of what they, you know, what we should be knowing about this, and a lot of really great clinical pearls. So I think uh, everybody could uh, take something from this. And you know, the few people who may say that they didn't feel more comfortable, you know, because people just feel uncomfortable treating herpetic disease. So uh, and and, and uh, using orals. So. They did a great job. Perfect. Thank you.